Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Niche cast. I am Mr. Young Slipperwera, aka the Diggity Doc, and we are here with the wildcard Aotearoa's finest footballing pundit. And that means he covers men's football in Aotearoa, and equally, it means he covers women's football. And we have the Women's World Cup. The Football Ferns suffered a first up defeat to the Netherlands. Zero to one, a uh, late goal, I believe, from the Dutch sealing that win. So we'll get the full lowdown, everything you need to know about that Football Ferns game and how they're looking from the dub card. As always, if you appreciate the niche cache and the niche cast, support us as best you can. The easiest way to do so is on Patreon. Uh, always on the on the hunt on the sniff around for a little podcast sponsor as well so if that's your buzz hook us up there otherwise just like subscribe rate review all that good stuff and wildcard <laughs> mr wildcard how the fuck are you i just want to get your thoughts here because i was watching a little thing about Kalen ponga and I've been quite fascinated by Kalen Ponga for a while now. Obviously, there's a there's a connection to Aotearoa there, but my I would probably say that Kalen Ponga is one my favourite rugby league player at the moment. Like favourite, not the best, just my favourite. And I was just little question here to set the scene before we get into football fans. Who is your favourite player in the NRL from the start of the season? Ooh. There's a question. Um, yeah, uh, well, on the topic of Kalen Ponga, I was, it's funny you said that because I was thinking the opposite as you were saying that. I don't know that he's my favourite, but I think he might be the best. And the last couple months of his form have just been through the roof. Highlighted relatively recently when he single-handedly demolished the uh, Dragons. And, I mean, there's a little bit of help from Mitchell Pierce, I suppose, on that occasion. But, Jesus, he was good. Like, that dude at his best is untouchable and does things that literally nobody else can do. So that's that's incredible. And I always do enjoy watching greatness and, uh, and action. And Kalen Ponga is right up there. But if you're, you're asking me my favorite, though, not who I think is my best. So my favorite on the basis of several just outstandingly feel-good stories from off the field... A uh, couple of crucial little uh, drop goals. The fact that he plays for the team that I support. The fact that he came back on the weekend and was 10 out of 10 brilliant and completely changed the the uh, the well trajectory of the Dragons team that week. I'm gonna I'm gonna chuck in a fella who I never would have come close to saying a couple years ago, but Corey Norman, Doc. I reckon Corey Norman. Jeepers creepers! That's one out. I know. Of I know. Pulling one out of the long grass here. I'd never think the wild card's favourite player at the moment. 12th of June 2019 is Corey Norman. He's been so good this season. And when he was out for a month with a broken cheek, the Dragons fell to absolute pieces. And then he came back and they put, what, 36 points on the dogs. Funny story about that. The drag. I worked this out the other day. The Dragons' points difference against the Bulldogs in two games this season is I think plus uh, what was it thirty six plus twenty is plus sixty two, and their points difference against everyone else is I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but it's in triple figure triple figures for the minus. It's like minus one hundred and two or something. So yeah, pretty one one for the one for the stat nerds out there. That's a pretty wild flip. So, in an ideal world, you're playing the Bulldogs every week. And uh, well, smoking I mean, them. I think every team in the NRL would say that in an ideal week, they could play the Bulldogs every time. That is true, Wildcard. I'm just fascinated by Ponga because any time he speaks, any time you read about him, hear about him, he's just an amazing person. And he's not only like an amazing person, he's, a, as you said, one of the best, if not the best player in the competition. And it's just... Kind of freakish. Also, shout out um, all about the fullbacks here. Uh, Shans Nickel Klockstad with the Canberra Raiders at fullback. Yeah, he's, a, he's a close contender. And on the back of last week, Jerome Hughes for the Melbourne Storm is a... he. Those three are my three favourite players at the moment in the NRL because they each just offer something a little bit funky, a little bit different. And they're all different to each other at, at the fullback position. 
Um, Jerome Hughes, a, a fairly small dude, but he has a huge impact on the game, and it's just awesome wild cards. So you're saying Corey Norman, I'm saying Caelan Pong, and we'll see how those uh, translate over the course of the season. This loss to the Netherlands first up, how do you, like, what was, were you coming into this game feeling like the football ferns would be targeting this game for a win? Or would they just be trying to get the best result they can and set the scene for the for the next two games? How did you approach like this game coming into it just with what you were hoping to see from the Football Ferns? And did you end up seeing what you were hoping to see from the Football Ferns in this opening World Cup fixture? That is a pretty nice perspective to start with, I think, because to be honest, like the Netherlands are the European champions. They they won in two, 2017. They won the Euros. They sort of like they were the hosts in that tournament. It was a little unexpected. They kind of had a good run, and that can happen in in um, continental tournaments like that. But you got to be pretty bloody solid to be at a level for yourself to be able to make a run like that and win a tournament like that. So we knew they were going to be a quality team. Just how quality is a little tricky because they've sort of been like they've only made one World Cup before. That was last time we played in their group then as well, and they beat us one nil then as well. <laughs> Pretty different contrasting games though, so it was a little hard to know exactly what to expect from them. Like it's been a rapid rise, so are they? So you know, are they ready for the stage? That kind of thing. And I didn't want to make predictions before the game because, to be honest, I felt like there was a decent chance we could lose. Like. 3 or 4 nil, 3 or 4 1 just because the absolute quality of that that front line it's not just their front three where you got um uh van der sanden from Lyon who have won i think four champions leagues in a row you've got uh lika martins who was the 2017 player of the year for fifa um vivian medina up front for arsenal scores bulks of goals and her Arsenal teammate, Daniele van der Donk, behind, uh, doing heaps of stuff. I've been working on my pronunciations over the last 24 hours there, Doc. So, like, this was a team that had the capabilities of kind of shredding us to pieces in a way, because I don't think they... I didn't think they were going to play the way England played, which is, you know, we were able to push England wide, get them chopping in crosses, and we were just winning those all day. So... It was a different kind of story. I thought they could do a little bit more closer to what USA did to us and just kind of really move that defense around and tear us to pieces. So I was worried. I was worried going into the game. But I also knew that they they may be a little bit shaky at the back. I think their tendency to want to pass the ball around uh, cost them a couple... Cost, it cost them at both ends, really, because it meant that players like Rosie White were able to put a bit of pressure on with the press there and... That led to a couple of very good chances in the first half. It also meant that they were a little, maybe a little too patient going forward, which certainly helped Abby Erseg and Rebecca Stott and Aaron Naylor and a lot of them playing great games at the back there. So yeah, I was I was nervous as to how the matchup would work, but I think Tom Samani came out and put in an absolutely perfect coaching performance. I don't think he could have set the team up any better. I think tactically he was perfect. Instead of going for the back five, he went with an extra midfielder, which worked wonders. Like, you can't go one-on-one -on -one against those players. They're too good, so you just you got to cut the supply lines. you got want that extra midfielder. Olivia Chance had a really good game as well, the person who came in. So I think Tom Samani couldn't have played it better. I think the effort from the players was outstanding. It's just when you lose at the end there so devastatingly, when you're so close, and you could see them for the last 10, 15 minutes, they were really tiring, and we were sitting back too deep, and we didn't have the outlets, and like the sort of inviting a bit of pressure, and there was no choice at that point because it had just taken too much to get to that point. We just had to hope we could hold on, and we couldn't quite. So there's two ways you can look at that. You can look at that from a, like... Well, we blew it. We could have got a great result here. We didn't. This is a bit of a bummer. And then we take this negative energy into the rest of the tournament. Or you can look at it and say, like, this was a nothing to lose game. Like, we were expected to lose by a lot more than we did. We pushed them the whole way. It took till the second minute of injury time before they finally broke through. Uh, we are not going to play a team as good as this again in the World Cup unless we you know, go pretty deep into it, in which case we're going to have done pretty well. We're going to have already ticked off our, our targets for the tournament. So repeat this performance against Canada, repeat this performance against Cameroon. We should find ourselves in the knockouts. Like We're going to do what we need to do if we can do exactly that again in the next two games against teams who do not have 
I'm I'm going to be a little bit rude here and say they don't like these the next two teams don't even have half the attacking quality that Netherlands have but maybe that's not unfair cuz Netherlands their front four is as good as any team in this tournament so to to have done as well as we did yeah like it's I think we exceeded expectations there's a bit of psychic damage from losing such a such a shattering um in such a shattering way right at the end there but we've learned if like if we've learned nothing about this team over the last 12 months other than the fact that they are a very resilient bunch i think that's enough to think that they can you know they can scrape themselves off get back up back on the horse go again against canada on the weekend and get a get a positive result there and i'm i'm boosted by it i'm like i'm pretty upset by the way they lost like it was devastating but i'm boosted by the performance and the way that they held netherlands in check for as long as they did couple key moments they didn't take which is which is disappointing like if we'd scored sort of 10 minutes into the second half there Sarah Gregorius had a couple chances if we'd scored then same time we scored against England you know and look how that went like it could have been something even more special but no I think I think beneath the um beneath the initial devastation of the result I think that is a positive performance and a positive way to start the tournament for the Ferns I think anyway. We'll find out when they go against Canada. We'll see how they how they go there. Did you see any change in style of play, formation, those sorts of things from the warm up games to this game? Like obviously tactics are gonna change uh from game to game, but did you see like was it a fairly predictable football firms? This is how they line up. This is how they operate. This is how they go about their business. Or did you? How did that just catch your eye with how the firms were were uh, lining up for this game? It was mostly as expected. I think, like, especially with Michaela Moore being injured, it put us in a point where I think there were you know ten spots were pretty locked. It was just a matter of whether you play a third centre back or a third midfielder, and I, yeah, I think I think that as Tom Samani did by far the right thing and. Rather than inviting pressure deeper, um, having that extra midfielder to help defend against a better team, I think maybe the back the back five is something you want to try against teams, maybe against Cameroon if we're going to do something like that because it gives you more room for your fullbacks to really push forward, and against a team like Netherlands with such like literally world class wingers, your your fullbacks are needed in the back line, so it's better just to be able to instead of inviting pressure, have be able to be a bit more proactive about it and get out in the midfield. So I wouldn't say that was unexpected, though, because throughout the warm-ups, they have been practicing both the back four and a back five, and they've even tried both in the same game on occasion. They started with a back five against England and had this exact same problem where they were, they were too deep, they were inviting too much pressure, they, were, they didn't have the midfield options in front of them, so they were getting stuck for clearances and losing the ball in bad areas. So then they switched to a back four and had much more success after that. So, like, they they have got to a point where I think, even though it was hard to know exactly which um, which formation Tom Samani would want to go with, they had, over the last six months, prepared for two variations. So they're pretty well drilled in either. So it wasn't a matter of, like, changing things up drastically and that being a big shocker. It was a matter of, like, which of these two well-drilled options do we want to go with? And I think... He proves in the pudding took the took the best option there and produced a very fine performance. Um, I also think just on that note, there were a couple of things sort of within the tactics, more about the approach, which which uh, we saw here as well as we've seen throughout any of the preparation, but which we have seen hints of. Like we could tell that they were building towards um, being a team that has a bit of a selective like. Not not a high press, but a selective high press where it's like, well, they'll two strikers hovering around when that loose touch comes to pounce on, you know, there were a couple of occasions. The two best chances in the first half actually came from this sort of situation where one was Sarah Gregorius holding the ball up, feeding in Rosie White, who smashed one out, um, drew a good save. The other was an even better example of just a... A Dutch centre back having a heavy touch, and all of a sudden Rosie White's all all over us, sneaks the ball away. Olivia Chance takes it, drives into the box, chips one onto the crossbar, like that close to scoring the opening goal, and just just being like 
This team knows that they're not going to have masses of possession, but they know what to do with the ball when they get it. So there's, it's defensive, but it's not passive. You know, it's their, um, it's the right way to be defensive, where you're proactive when you get the ball. You know exactly what you're going to do. These are the lines, like these are the channels we want to attack. Winger running in this angle. Um, we want to, you know, quick pass before the defense is able to get set. Take before the defense is able to get set, taking advantage of the transitional stuff, that kind of thing. So we've seen a lot of that at the Cup of Nations, sort of especially building towards that. I think we saw here what the culmination of that could look like. Also just being a team that plays very aggressive. I think led superbly by Rhea Percival in the midfield, who just sets the tone by diving into every challenge, getting a foot on the ball at any possibility and just making sure the opposition know it's not going to be an easy game there. Like, we we were diving into those 50-50 tackles, and I think a sneaky um, a sneaky undercover uh, positive as well from that approach is that we were able to be quite physical, but we didn't pick up any yellow cards, so, you know, there's no lingering suspensions or anything. Um, we didn't give away any free kicks in particularly dangerous areas, so it was all, like, it was all nice and well-organized, and I... I think a lot of credit there has to go to Tom Samani for sure for, for the way he set up the team, but also like having the players to execute the plan certainly does the trick. Um, we did still lose this game though, so I don't want to get too like dramatic over the the highs and the lows or anything. Like there's, they're well poised to succeed at this World Cup, but it's you know they're starting from scratch in the next game. They've they've got to take what they do and repeat it exactly, or else. You know, Canada are a team that's a little bit too good to be taken lightly. We we started the podcast with favourite players, and it's a just a topic and a and a concept that I really enjoy because as as I as I said with that whole idea, it's not who's the best, it's who's your favourite. Who do you like watching the most? Who who do you just who are you drawn to when watching the sport and competition? Who in this football ferns team have you noted? from that first game mainly as someone who you're just like you're just like oh, i just want to keep a close eye on that joker and see see what happens in the next game the next few games how they progress and what sort of influence they can have on the team yeah, there's a few different variations on that idea isn't there because it's like favorite is what you what you admire not just as a you know as a as a writer watching a game trying to describe exactly what happened but as a fan enjoying the whole process of it and they're a likable team there are a lot of different options i could go with here i think the the standout is probably abby ursig because when you talk about like there's been a bit of buzz lately about you know the the under 17 girls last year doing so well coming third at their world cup the under 20 lads just a couple weeks ago playing as well as they did playing so confidently playing such an enjoyable style of football at, at their world cup obviously the ferns are restricted at a much higher level as senior World Cup here and that they can't just knock the ball around and play perfect flowing football like the Dutch were trying to do. We just don't have the technical ability of players. So we've set up certainly in a in a formation that best plays to the advantages that we have. But I think one player who just like exudes world class at every um at every opportunity is Abby Ursik, who like she's a player who would fit into any defense at this tournament for any team like she is just pure and simply one of the best defenders on the planet and the ability to win pretty much bloody every header that comes her way the the way she reads the game and just like the confidence and you know the best players in football always seem to have more time than everyone else is the thing like they don't look rushed they know exactly what their dis- what their processes are what their decision making is going to be like this is the pass i'm looking for this is my backup option she's just like she doesn't get caught on the ball she doesn't um she doesn't like play nervous or frantic like long balls without thinking like everything seems purposeful and and that's just like to have someone that calm at the back for a New Zealand team at a World Cup I think is enormous because it's just like that kind of confidence feeds into every other player on the on the team to be honest the OG the veteran the greatest are, are you would you sit with Abby Ursig as the greatest female footballer from Aotearoa yeah, I would. I, I don't even think it's up for much debate, to be honest. Like, what she's achieved, and she's, like, 29 or something, so it's not like she's 
wrapped up yet she'll be at the next world cup if she wants to be there like there's a there's a lot more there's a few more chapters in the story to be written for sure but what she's achieved already so far like captaining the um north carolina courage to the greatest single nwsl season in history last year named defender of the like defender of the season in that tournament which like the american competition is top notch there is a couple of dud teams at the bottom there always seems to be but like that courage team could compete with all of the top teams in Europe. I'm not saying necessarily they'd be able to beat a team like Leon, but they could certainly compete with a team like that. They could certainly compete with the team like Manchester City or Chelsea or Arsenal or um, Juventus or Barcelona. I mean, Leon are sort of on another level. Is a is a bit of a trick. They just win the Champions League every year. Top team in France win eight nil every week at home. Like it's um. Yeah, it's hard to compare against different things, but I think that the level that team plays at and the level Abby Ursig plays for them and what she's achieved for New Zealand as well, which hopefully we're about to see a crowning um, achievement of that. But yeah, I, I don't think it's debatable that she's our finest female footballer. That would be an interesting concept, like getting a couple of the best teams from America to play against the European teams because it's a fairly unique situation that you definitely don't have on the men's side of the ledger because there's no real it's a it's a monopoly it's all europe in yeah, the in the world outside of, one or two teams in south america and even then they don't have anywhere near the money that the top european teams have exactly whereas on the football side of things you might as you said you might be able to set up a fixture where you take the best team from america and put them up against just to see just for us to get a gauge of where the um, best competition is for uh... well you know what they did a little bit of that last year they um i think i think it's the i can't remember if there was another american team involved but the courage hosted sort of midway through their season they hosted this like international champions cup or they had some you know relatively inane name for it and they they won it they um i can't remember exactly who they beat i could look it up but uh, I think they beat Manchester City, and I, Leon were there, but I don't think they played them. I'm not sure, but it was like obviously an asterisk because this was the Courage mid-season looking absolutely unstoppable against European teams who were definitely like just in their pre-season warming up, and they weren't taking it as seriously. But I mean, they competed, so I'm confident they could give them a run. I don't think they are as good as the top teams in Europe, but I think they can hang about with them, you know. Roger that. We will finish with just an idea here. If the football fans are to defeat Canada, what bloody Canada? What needs to happen? Who needs to have like perform at what level? Type of type of scenario. Like if the football fans are to defeat Canada, what are some things that would have happened in that game? Well, first of all, the blatantly obvious one is they would have to have scored at least one goal um as to how they score that goal i don't think the approach has to change because canada is still going to probably dominate possession in that game but canada are also going to um they're gonna you know that should be a little more balanced than the game against the netherlands was and Canada have Christine Sinclair up front, who is a striker as good as anyone out there and has been for 10 years, like one of the best in the world. But pretty debatable as to whether they have the depth behind her. A lot of young players coming through for Canada, so it's not like they're a, um, it's not like they're a rubbish team or anything. It's just that they're a little bit unproven in a few key areas. So New Zealand, with all the experience we have, with the tactical discipline we have, I, I certainly think we can hang about there and I mean can we keep a clean sheet against a team like that I don't know but Canada struggled to score against Cameroon and Cameroon are also going to be a, like they're not a team you can underrate but they are the fourth ranked team in the group out of four so you know Canada's winning goal they only won 1-0 and their winning goal came from a header from a corner when just no one marked her at the far post so it's not like um it's not like they carved them open and I would be very interested to see how Netherlands go against those two teams as well because I think Netherlands, for one thing, I think Netherlands will get a lot of confidence from beating New Zealand the way they did and I expect them to play better in the following games going into the knockouts and I'd be surprised if that team doesn't make the quarterfinals, to be honest. But Canada are a little more sketchy in that they're a bit, yeah, they're like it's hard to know what to expect from any of these teams without 
without um you know until the game actually kicks off and we actually get to see so it's hard to make predictions but I do think that we can compete with Canada. We drew with them at the last World Cup, so we got to trust that we've gotten better since then. And that was in Canada as well, so a little bit of a boost for the home team. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't like. I'm just I'm worried about being able to put the goals away. It's been the main problem the whole way through because I trust our defense, I trust our midfield to do what they need to do. But just owning those big moments is a theme I've come back to a lot in the writing about this about this team. And against England, they own the big moments. You know, they they came up with those crucial tackles, crucial saves when they needed to. And then when they got that one key massive opportunity early in the second half, Rosie White with a shot, keeper spilled it, Sarah Gregorius pounces, New Zealand 1-0 up, and we held on to win from there. Um, we didn't do that against Wales. A few days later, Gregorius missed a penalty, and then Wales scored right at the end of the game. So, you know, it's just... Closing games out for a team like New Zealand seems to be a little bit of a problem. Not just games, but closing out halves. Like, Netherlands scored right at the end of that game to win it. They also missed a very good chance. Uh, their centre-back um, put one wide from a bit of a loose ball. Just like in, It was either in stoppage time in the first half or just before that. Either way, late in the first half. Like That could have changed the complete complexion of the game if she just slipped that one to the back of the net. And it would have been another goal late in the half for the Ferns who have to work very hard to compete, are good enough to do that, but that does leave question marks over fitness. And certainly the fitness against Netherlands was, was an issue in the last 20. You could see them tiring. You could see even before that, you could see Rosie White and Sarah Gregorius who have to work so hard up front, just covering so much ground, like two players doing the work of four there. Obviously, they were exhausted, so recovery before the Canada game is a big one. Canada won't work us around as much as Netherlands, so hopefully it won't be as much of a problem. But yeah, like the the hints against Wales of not being able to close that one out, and then even though it was a friendly, it didn't really matter. So I, I don't, I'm not too worried about that. It's just that it's a it's um, a bit of a mirror image compared to the Netherlands game. So yeah, take that, take the little fitness issues, take the thing about the big moments, like putting the chances away. Didn't do that in this game. We had one or two or three or maybe even four very good chances. You either need that like that stunning opportunity to float into the top corner and like you score an amazing goal that just breaks it open, or you need to take that half chance that you know that might be there for the taking and you can't worry about whether the next one's going to come around because a team like the Ferns, it might not. You just have to take the one in the moment when it arrives. And if we do that against Canada, I think we'll be in a good position to get a good result. So it's just like, it's there's no point saying will they or won't they. I'm just saying if they do, then that's going to that's gonna be the difference. Own the key moments. As I guess is always a, a good piece of advice for people, isn't it, Doc? Own the key moments. Yeah, I was just about to say you're not really breaking any any new ground there, Wildcard. <laughs> Do you have any no. any other miscellaneous thoughts on the football ferns and the women's World Cup that you'd like to share with our beautiful listeners? Well, did you see Australia lost in the last minute as well? It must mm. be an Australasian thing. That was a very different game, though. Australia dominate. Well, they didn't dominate, They but they did have the bulk of the chances against Italy. They should have beaten them. They had a better team. They had, you know, the better performance, but they just looked so sketchy at the back. They Italy scored right at the end. It was quite funny because Italy had the ball in the corner. They were posted up for a draw. They were just shielding the ball, ready to take what they had. Won a corner from shielding the ball around that and then, like, whipped in the corner and scored from it. Uh, last minute, last minute winner there. Like, they were happy with the draw and they ended up winning. So, a bit, a bit crazy. But they'd also had two goals disallowed for offside, but correctly, correctly disallowed. But also, like, it just shows that Aussie defense isn't up to a whole lot. So, Australia versus Brazil is going to be fun because I don't think either of those teams know how to defend, but I think both of them know how to score a lot of goals. So that one might be like five four or something. It's been a good World Cup. It's tricky, like. It's tricky being through the middle of the night. It's bloody difficult to stay up and watch as much as possible. But contrasting with the Cricket World Cup, or not even contrasting, like in alignment with the Cricket World Cup, you know, there's... Uh, uh, I tell you what, I'm I'm, I'm getting pretty um, drastically short on sleep at the moment, Doc. Have you got any tips for staying up through the middle of the night? I wouldn't mind hearing them. Well, we'll, we'll let you, better let you get a little afternoon nap in here. Yeah, I do. <laughs> 
I am working on it's been one of my targets. It's uh, it's working nicely. The power nap. I am working on a bit of a hypothesis though, um, that defense is overrated, and we don't yeah. need to we don't need to extrapolate that out further much further in this podcast episode. But it's just an idea I had um, just thinking about the Warriors and how they've put a lot of energy into apparently their defense, but. I and you know you always hear how defense wins championships so defense might win this world cup for whoever wins the football world cup on the women's side attack is pretty good as well <laughs> like your your defense is only good if you can score more than the opposition obviously the two go hand in hand but yeah I'm I'm just working on this idea that that defense is overrated yeah, it's a, it's a good hypothesis. I, well, I'm tempted to take it one further and say that defense and attack are both overrated because what you really need is balance, isn't it? It's like it's not whether you can defend or whether you can attack. It's whether you can do both and at, at a level that elevates each of the other. Like good, you know, what they say the best defense is good attack and vice versa. And like if you have a lot of the ball and create a lot of chances you're going to be doing less defending which makes your defense look better and you know less tired and more uh zoned in and all this like and it works the other way around like i just i just think i see this all the time like um this is a little bit of a tangent but i was thinking about this just before when pete i saw someone talking about solving the climate crisis and i'm like mate you don't solve the climate like, it's not a problem that you can find a solution for and then just be done with. Because the environment is an ecosystem, you know? It's a holistic thing. It's a, it's a um, endless circle, you know? You find balance. You get everything in alignment with each other. And that's how you, that's how you, um, you know, find... I, it's, I, I don't know how to finish that sentence because there's no closure. Like, there's no closure to this. It's an ongoing thing. You just continually go around in the circle and adjust the bits that need adjusting. You don't, you don't solve it. You just balance it. Those are those are words to live by, and the words that we'll uh, hold dear to our hearts as as we progress through the niche case offices. We yeah, we don't right we on. don't we don't solve it. We just balance it. I mean, it works. Oh, it definitely works. It's a it's a bloody uh, gem that you've just dropped for the. For the lucky listeners, sticking through another episode of the Niche Cast, go out there, balance it, and kia ka. <laughs> we'll see you. Uh, we've got the Black Caps playing overnight Thursday night into Friday. I'll be yeah, back. Yeah, if just, it doesn't rain. Yeah, I'll be back just before then with the uh, Rugby League uh, podcast. Tonga have just named their squad to face Aotearoa. So a little bit of funk in there. Very interested to see what squad Michael Maguire names. And then we've got Black Caps taking on India. Holy shit. I don't even want to start thinking about that just yet. Like, we'll say, I'll save for any Black Caps thoughts for tomorrow when I wake up because at the moment, oh, it's just too much for me to take wild card. Yeah, I mean, this is when it gets real, isn't it? The same for the footy fans, to be honest, because this was a nothing-to-lose game against Netherlands. But from now on, like you can't afford a bat, like you can't afford to do this again. You can get away with the last minute, um, last minute winner against you in that first game. If you do it in the second game, you're pretty doomed. And yeah, Canada, they they're gonna have to be up for that, and the Black Caps gonna have to be up for India. Cause, well, oh yeah, <laughs> I guess they don't. Is the thing with the Black Caps, they can because they won those first three games because of the luckiness with the draw. They don't actually probably have to win, but. To be honest, I, um, I'm i torn at the moment because I think a rained-off result would actually be really good for the Black Caps, but I I hate not watching cricket. I hate rained-off results. I'd rather almost lose than have a, you know, no contest. So it's kind of like that one game for the football fans was equivalent to the first three games to the Black Caps. Like, yeah. Yeah, it probably was. <laughs> I'm sure there's some mathematics involved there, but who cares? Well, well Black Caps got nine games, don't they? So th- three blocks of three. Fern's got three games. Right, oh, well, Cud, you just made me look like a complete muppet. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a it's a Wednesday the afternoon. Pod. There's no there's no need for mathematics on a Wednesday afternoon wild card. So, we'll keep it moving. 
stay tuned for a rugby league episode of the niche cast in black caps and by the time that's all wrapped up we should be back with the second football ferns game they take on canada overnight saturday wildcard oh, i believe see the yeah I can't remember. I, I think, think it might Saturday be morning 7 a.m. No, I think it's Sunday. Yeah, I think it's Sunday morning, 7 a.m. Yes, it's sun, Sunday morning, 7 a.m. Football Ferns from Aotearoa taking on Canada. Be there or listen on the Nishcast. See you later. <laughs>